I'm next going to move into a demonstration of a biocompiler and how to build chemical reaction networks that way. So I'm going to briefly go over um, this Jupyter notebook, which I made into some slides. These are all online, and this will work as sort of the workbook you guys are going to use for your, for your workshop today and show you how to create chemical reaction networks in biocompiler and simulate them. So I've already told you what a chemical reaction network is. So we can just go straight to the code. The first thing you need to do with basically any coding situation is import your dependencies. So we're going to use these packages. Biocompiler is what's going to build and, and keep track of chemical reaction networks for us. We'll use Bioscrape for simulation. You won't actually ever use that directly, but it's worth importing to make sure it's there. We'll use NumPy to produce arrays. PyLab, which is a, a stripped down version of matplotlib for plotting and Pandas will uh, help us store and access simulation results. And all of these are in the prereq software. So if you've got things installed, you will have all of these. So as, I, as I've said, chemical reaction networks are a set of species and a set of reactions. So the first thing we have to make are uh, species. And Biocompiler is an object-oriented framework. So when I say we're going to create a species object, I mean we're going to create this variable which we call A, which is going to be of type species and has certain properties. And the properties of species in Biocompiler are their name, in this case it's called A, it can have a material type, and it can have a list of attributes. And in most things in Biocompiler you can print. If you want to ever see what something is, you just say print it, um, and it will try to show you some representation of that thing so you can easily get output of the models you're making. So here when we type the print A, we get our material type M1, underscore our name, underscore our list of attributes. And that is sort of the string identifier of species called A. Now I can make a second species with the same name, but material type and attributes are actually optional. And these two species will be different because even though they have the same name, they have different materials and different attributes. So I now make A2, I leave material type and attributes empty. I print it, it just says its name is A, so it's not showing any material types or attributes because they're not there. And I ask, is A equal to A2? And they're not equal because they have different material and attributes, even though they have the same name. And we very commonly do this. If you imagine you have a gene call it X, and it produces a transcript, transcript X, which produces a protein, protein X, right? So this is really for your convenience. You could write out for their names, you know, gene X, transcript X, protein X, maybe you want to call them all X and just change their material type. Or similarly, maybe you have a protein that can have be phosphorylated or not phosphorylated. Well, attributes might be a way to take is the same protein, but you know, the phosphorylated or the non-phosphorylated version. There's also complexes. These are for using um, bound species. It's a different type of species. It does some automatic naming for you. They're worth reading about, but I'm not going to go into them. Um, so if you look at this uh, notebook, you can read about this on your own. How do you create reactions? So I'll start with making mass action reactions. These are very easy. Um, I say my R1 is equal to reaction dot from mass action, and I then give it a list of inputs. This is 2A. You'll note you can't write 2 times A. You have to write A comma A. And then we have B. Um, so this is the reaction 2A goes to B. And I give it a rate K forward. And so this is, as we've mentioned, mass action reactions have this propensity function, which has one parameter, which is the rate. I can print it in this simple way, where I just sort of see the reaction, but don't see a lot of details about it. Or I can use this pretty print functionality, which shows me what the rate looks like and what my parameters are. If I want to make my mass action reactions reversible, it's very easy. I make R2 is still reaction up from mass action, but here I add in one more keyword K reverse. And so now I'm going to make two reactions, A and B go to C1, A and B go to this complex, and C1 goes back to A and B. Um, and you'll see this is forwards and backwards. So you have the two arrows there. And if you look at the more complicated way of printing things, it's going to show you a forward propensity and a reverse propensity and the parameters for each of them. Putting this all together to make a chemical reaction network is easy. I just type chemical reaction network and define it to a variable, CRN. You can call it something else if you want. 
and I give it a list of species, A, B, and C1, and my reactions R1 and R2, and then I can print it. And, um, and when I print it, I get all of my species. I get their initial concentrations if I've set those. Um, I sh and I see all my reactions. And you'll notice you can do things with this pretty print function like show rates, show parameters, different things like that to help you um, see what you have going on in the chemical reaction network. And there's a bunch of examples there on the uh, biocompiler GitHub showing you how to use this function. Once you have a chemical reaction network, you might want to write it as SBML to save it. This is how you save your model. Well, you just do crn.writesbml, give it some name, and it will save the file for you. SBML is a great file for computers and a terrible file format for people. Here, I printed off the top of an SBML file for you. And I just want to notice that you never want to write these by hand. They're very uh, clunky looking. They're hard to read. And that's why we have software like BioCompiler to help you write SBML files easily. What's nice about SBML is that it allows you to interface with many, many different simulators. So although I've mentioned that we're using Bioscrape, you by no means have to use Bioscrape yourself. You could load SBML into any of the other simulators I mentioned in the PowerPoint. One nice thing about using Bioscrape, though, is that we provided some support for it so you can simulate stuff automatically with Bioscrape, crn.simulate with Bioscrape, or simulate with Bioscrape via SBML. Um, and you give it your time points and your initial condition. And so what does that look like? This is just for plotting. I make my initial condition dictionary. A dictionary is a mapping, if you don't know. So it's saying that I take the string representation of my species A, and if I ask my dictionary for that string representation of A, it's going to return 10. So this is telling me that the initial concentration of A is 10. I define my time points here. I'm going from 0 to 5 with 100 time points in between. And now I just type in R is equal to crn.simulate with Bioscrape via SBML. I give it my time and I give it my initial condition. And it's going to return a pandas data frame. These are really easy to use. You take R, which is my results, and I say, I want to get the time out of it. And you get the time. Or you say, I want to get the species A. So I type in STRA and I get the concentration of species A over time. Um, and then I can plot this very easily using the results. And you see that. Uh, a is going to go down, my complex goes up, and then down again, and B is slowly produced. Biocompiler can also make non-mass action propensities. So let's give you an example of that. It's a little bit different. Here, I have to make my propensity object similar to the way I make species and reactions. I can also make propensities. So I make a hill positive propensity in this case. I pass in my parameters, which have values. In this case, S1 is R, is a regulator, is a, a species, not a number but everything else is a number. And now I create my reaction, my reaction with the Hill positive, uh, I call it R Hill positive, and I just type in reaction. I have my inputs A goes to B, and my propensity type is Hill positive. And I just passed in this guy to here. And I can print it out, and it's going to show me what that looks like with all the parameters as well as my rate. I can do the same thing with Hill negative, and it's exactly the same. But here I'm making, oh, it says hill positive here. Oops, typo. This should say hill negative. But it would be the same way. Proportional hill positive, et cetera. Uh, proportional hill negative. And finally, it's worth noting there's a general propensity type where you can type in any rate formula you want. Um, so if you don't like the ones that we have built in, you want to invent your own new type of propensity function. So uh, in next, we're going to break out into uh, little groups. So here are two exercises actually three that you guys can work on. So the first exercise is to examine this michaelis menten uh, kinetics, although here we're basically having A, uh, yeah, A is being converted to B. And I want you to, to simulate this. So write out this as a mass action chemical reaction network. And then I want you to write it out as a Hill function chemical reaction network. And then I want you to examine how the different parameters, KU, KB, and KCAT, um, can cause the models to agree or disagree to really get into the, the idea that Hill functions approximate mass action kinetics, and sometimes those approximations break. The second exercise is very similar, where you'll be looking at a mass action model of um, a gene that binds to a repressor. And then you can also uh, simulate that with a Hill function. And I want you to look at when the Hill function and, and the mass action model agree or disagree. And finally, if you're an overachiever and want a more advanced exercise, 
um, I've created that model I showed you of the signal binding to the transcription factor, binding to the gene, et cetera, um, as a mass action model. And a challenge is to see what is the smallest you can make the model. So how many Hill function reductions can you use and make it so it still matches the original dynamics of the CRN? And maybe there's constraints on the initial conditions and rates to make that possible. So this is kind of an open-ended question. I have a big model with many species and many reactions. Can you simplify it dramatically? And, and how, how much so?